If I start off this video by singing Death of a Bachelor, but saying Death of an Author, will I get copyright striked? Full transparency. This video is for an English class I'm taking. Uh, but I thought, what better excuse to turn a class into something I really, really love, which is Harry Potter. Today I specifically want to talk about how Harry Potter as a fandom has collectively divorced J.K. Rowling as the author and controller of the content of the fandom. This is kind of a unprecedented event when it comes to fandoms and all that kind of stuff. Fandoms normally rely on their author to give them more content, to give them more ideas in order for the fans to play around with it, to make fan fictions, to all of this stuff. J.K. Rowling, on the other hand, she did so much that the fans said, we don't like you anymore, we're gonna take over. This is weird, right? Normally when you hear about a piece of media, it's like so-and-so wrote this piece of media and fans like it and they follow them on Twitter and they hear all the updates about things and they ask the author questions to see what about this? What if this happened? How would this have worked? And J.K. Rowling for a little bit, well, for a lot of it, was that for the Harry Potter fandom, right? She was the author that people followed on Twitter to get updates like, ooh, what Hogwarts house is the rock in? And things like that, right? Where fans would have questions, ask J.K. Rowling, and then J.K. Rowling would hopefully answer them. Things like, Harry Potter is a horcrux how come when he got bit by the basilisk, the horcrux still stayed alive, even though basilisk venom is supposed to destroy those things? And J.K. Rowling would reply, and she would say, because Harry wasn't damaged beyond all recognition. He would have had to die in order for the horcrux to be removed from him. That kind of thing. Fans respected J.K. Rowling for a long time with that. Gradually, J.K. Rowling grew a little bit more weird. There were a few Twitter posts that she made that fans were like, that's weird and nobody asked for that. But the Harry Potter fandom as a whole still went through that whole thing where we were like, give us more, give us more content, please give us some more content. And now, if you look at the Harry Potter fandom now, we don't want that at all, in the slightest. Why did that happen? There are lots of fandoms in the world. There are so many. And Harry Potter is one of the biggest ones of all time. How come the Harry Potter fandom decided collectively to stop listening to the author, and it still worked. For those of you who don't keep up with the JK Rowling drama and all of that stuff, there are a few tweets that got put out, and actually a f quite a bit of them, that made fans a little bit uneasy to support her just because of her moral beliefs, not really anything to do with the context of the story. These things sort of bubble up, it became a controversy, yada yada yada. Harry Potter fandom decides we don't like her anymore and they stop listening to her. What that looks like on a grand scale is that J.K. Rowling makes new content. She's still making new content. She made Cursed Child. While she isn't directing Fantastic Beasts, she was a big pusher of that creative area. And while all those things are going on, fans don't really treat that as much as canon as the other stuff that was made. They don't treat it as canon as the original series was. They also, when this first initially happened, had this whole meme where they would just take random people and say, you know, so-and-so, the author of the Harry Potter series. Uh, and that was really funny, actually, for a long time. I still laugh at those. But my question, or my argument rather, is how come this worked? Should it have happened? Should it have not happened? What are the pros and cons of either side? For the most part, the Harry Potter fandom hasn't really been affected too much. They're still actively participating in the fandom, and even from the beginning, Harry Potter was a fan-oriented fandom. Fans would make headcanons, and they would play around with it. There are so many aspects of the Harry Potter series that just J.K. Rowling didn't comment on, didn't go further into, that fans got to take these little corners and make them their own. The Marauders are a huge example of this. J.K. Rowling doesn't really talk about the Marauders a lot. Marauders are Harry Potter's dad and his friends from when they went to Hogwarts. We see some exposition into who those characters are, right? Remus, Sirius, and Peter are all alive during Harry Potter's story. 
and we get to see sort of how they interact with each other and we get all of the stories of how they interacted with James when James was alive. And so we get that, right? We know Harry was his son and, and they made a map and they, are, they became illegal and a magi and Remus is a werewolf and they were all friends and it was good and they were pranksters. We know this. This is all context that J.K. Rowling provided to us in the text. She also actually wrote a short story about a shenanigan with James and Sirius. So we have a little bit extra than just the original series, but that's about all we have. Harry Potter fans have taken the Marauders and made it their own thing. It's kind of crazy how many things that I thought were just true about these people that were never even mentioned in the text that fans have just adopted as a core belief of who these characters are. For example, I I think Sirius is mentioned in the books with having long black hair, but I don't think it was ever mentioned that he wears a leather jacket. And if it was, maybe it was just an off chance. But if you look at Harry Potter fan art, Harry Potter fan fictions, anything to do with Sirius Black, he is always depicted in a leather jacket. And this is just a choice that fans made and have collectively adopted as truth and canon. When Curse of Child was published, there were a lot of fans who were very interested in what this story would be, right? For years, fans have been clamoring for new content, for new stuff. We want to hear more about Harry Potter. We want more of the world. And Krista Child was published and people were excited. I remember personally buying it the day it came out. I was supposed to go on a camping trip with friends and my mom was like, oh, we'll have to read it when we come back. But we stopped by a Walmart and it was just there. And my mom bought it and I was the first one in my family to read it. And when I tell you I read it and my heart sunk. I was in misery. I hated the story the second I read it. I went in with an open mind because I was so excited. Coming from someone who was not in the Harry Potter fandom when the books were being written and the movies were being made, having this piece of content that J.K. Rowling had made and added onto the story was very exciting for me. But when I read it, I was beyond disappointed. And I think most of the fans were too. There was a little bit of a debate as to whether or not it was good, as whether or not we should accept it as canon. People who saw the stage show, because this was originally a play, thought it was very good. And there were mixed reactions with that, right? They saw it and they were like, this is good. I don't know if I like it in the Harry Potter universe, but it's good. And there were some people who really genuinely liked it and adopted it completely into their personal canon of Harry Potter. The people who didn't have the chance to see the show and just read it, it, most of them hated it. There have been lots of video essays done, lots of posts, and lots of blog articles, and all sorts of things that explain why Cursed Child sucks. And I may make a video about that sometime in the future. But the general consensus was, Cursed Child wasn't that good. Do we adopt it as canon? And for the most part, I don't think the fandom has. I think it did create a resurgence and in interest in the Harry Potter children, but it didn't really add anything to the canon. It wasn't anything new. People already had ideas about Harry's children, about Ron and Hermione's children, and fan fictions had already been written before Cursed Child had even thought of being published, and that didn't change. Scorpius was still in Slytherin. There was still some debate about whether or not Albus was in Gryffindor or Slytherin. The whole Rose situation about whether or not these two characters were gay or these two characters had the hots for each other. That was all still there before and after Cursed Child. Cursed Child really didn't leave as big of a dent in the Harry Potter fandom as it was originally intended. We move on to Fantastic Beasts. The movies, right? People were very excited about this, specifically because Newt Scamander was a Hufflepuff. This is a type of story we didn't get to see often, and a lot of fans really resonated with the whole Cedric story, which unfortunately only existed in the fourth book. Of course, later it became important with how Voldemort really didn't care about blood purity. He just wanted to take over the world and you know there's some symbolism with that. It carried a lot of weight in the battle at Hogwarts, but Cedric for the most part was stuck in the fourth book. Seeing a character like Newt Scamander, who is so different from our normal perspective of a Gryffindor protagonist, really got people excited. And for the most part, the first movie had a very, very good reaction. The second movie came out, and it came out to far more mixed reactions. I know myself personally, I was not the biggest fan of it. There were some things that were like, okay, this could be interesting in the future. I'm sort of excited to see how that plays out. But there were other things that made me nervous. Things that were like, ugh, that doesn't feel right to the story. And there were a lot of people who also felt that 
because of the whole Newt Scamander story, how come we hadn't heard it in the original seven Harry Potter books? It felt like something that was incredibly important, almost like, you know, World War II and the Holocaust for the real world, that's what this Grindelwald thing was supposed to be. But it wasn't really brought up in the original seven books at all, really, except for the fact that Grindelwald and Dumbledore had some sort of relationship. But Newt Scamander wasn't mentioned really at all, besides being the textbook author. Cut to more recent news, the third movie has come out. I think it has more positive reactions than the second one. It sort of fixed a lot of the issues with the second one, although some of the more interesting things that occurred in the second one were put to a stop in the third one, which made me a little bit disappointed. I still would say third movie is better than the second one. With fans, it was a little bit mixed, right? Some of them didn't want to go because of the whole Johnny Depp situation. Some of them didn't want to go because they didn't like the second one. It was, a, it was very mixed. And while that can be good or bad, it still didn't really leave a big impact on the Harry Potter fandom itself. Harry Potter in many ways grew up as the internet grew up. While the internet was developing and becoming as we know it today, so was Harry Potter. They were sort of both created and published around the same time. And so we have a lot of internet chats and all this sort of things where fans of this book series were finally able to talk together about theories and about ideas and about all sorts of things. J.K. Rowling was one of the first authors to actively advocate for fans doing this, for coming up with ideas, for coming up with theories, even for writing fan fictions. Most authors didn't actually like when people wrote fan fictions of their stuff. They saw it as a form of plagiarism. But J.K. Rowling was one of the first who was like, actually, I like it. That means my fans like my stuff. I actively encourage it. J.K. Rowling was in lots of ways not your usual author. Most writers sort of kept a mysterious facade. Think J.R.R. Tolkien, C.S. Lewis, or even just Lemony Snicket. Most authors carried around this aura of exclusive Exclusivity. As though the author wasn't really important, they were just here to give you the story. J.K. Rowling changed all of that. From the beginning, had a very active Twitter where she interacted with fans, came up with new canon, and answered questions. And so it's sort of a surprise that when J.K. Rowling did something the fans didn't like, the fans were so willing to cut her out of the picture. Now what are the pros and cons of doing that? For one, you could see the fandom as though it had a lack of guidance, as though it's all fan-driven and so it goes all over the place and it could split. We could see an unprecedented fandom war, which we haven't seen in years. On the other hand, with fans controlling the narrative, they get to make it sort of their own and take into account all of these ideas and things that they have and share them with the world. One of the most interesting things I find about the Harry Potter fandom is that even though J.K. Rowling herself is transphobic, the types of people who are attracted to her stories definitely don't align with that way of thinking. Most Harry Potter fans are members of the LGBTQ plus group or are active allies. The fact that Harry Potter is a play on Christian values and J.K. Rowling's entire story about reclaiming her Christianity is ironic. From the very beginning, we saw sort of this dynamic between J.K. Rowling and the fans, the types of people the fans were and the type of person J.K. Rowling was. We saw her try to appeal to these people by saying Dumbledore is gay outside of the text and just on her Twitter without any support evidence or anything else besides it. This was a direct appeal at those fans who saw all sorts of relationships in Harry Potter that J.K. Rowling didn't originally write. By divorcing the author, the fans have created a space for themselves where they can make all of these headcanons and draw all of these theories and just talk about the things that they like without being constrained with this idea of canon that has to be true at all times. Fans get to take back these sections like the Marauders, like the New Generation, and do what they want with them, for better or for worse. As a whole, we can safely assume the Harry Potter fandom is here to stay, and that unless a fandom war breaks out, which I don't see happening any time in the near future, the Harry Potter fandom will continue to function as well as it has the entire time. With J.K. Rowling out of the picture, the fandom now becomes the fans. It isn't for certain whether or not these additions to the fandom, like the continued Fantastic Beasts, are going to leave a lasting impact on the fandom at all, or whether the fans will do what they have always done, which is take the parts they like, shove out the things they don't, and insert their own ideas. The Harry Potter fandom will continue to thrive for at least a few more generations, and it will be without J.K. Rowling's help, or hindrance. As for now, the Harry Potter fandom is still going strong, and I doubt that will change any time in the near future. Huh. Bye. <laughs>
nice. Yeah, yeah, jokes. Ha <laughs> ha.